another minute or two so people can come in. Welcome. Nice to see some familiar names and the attendees. It's great seeing people come to multiple events. Absolutely brilliant. Happy to have you back. All right. So I think we're gonna go ahead and make a start. So thank you so much um, <clears throat> everyone for joining us and thank you to our wonderful author for joining us today, Gary McKenzie. So I'm gonna introduce Gary to you and then hand it over to him to let him share some from his wonderful book. So Gary McKenzie is a poet and nonfiction writer based in Fife. He's won the Robert McClellan Poetry Competition and the Wigton Poetry Competition, and his book, Scotland, A Literary Guide for Travelers, is published by Bloomsbury. His book-length poem, Ben Doran, A Conversation with a Mountain, great title, is just out with the Irish Pages Press. And we're gonna be linking to that as well in the chat. So do have a look if you'd like to grab a copy of that. Ben Doran explores the ecology of a Scottish Highland mountain and its herd of red deer, drawn in part from Gary's translation of an 18th century Gaelic poem and incorporating contemporary environmental knowledge. Ben Doran is a conversation between Scotland's Celtic heritage and the modern Anthropocene world. So we're really, really excited to welcome Gary McKenzie to the Stay at Home Festival. Welcome, Gary. Thank you very much, Carly. It's great to be here. It's great to be uh, reading to you tonight. So as Carly says, I'm going to be reading from my new book. It's only out about three weeks. So it's, um, it's a newborn baby. I'm very excited to be uh, sharing it with you today. Um, this is a copy of it here. I'll give you a, a slide of the cover in a moment just to give you a better sense of it. But this is this is what it looks like. The, the really exciting thing, this is, um, this is um, a photograph of Ben Doran, the mountain uh, which the poem is about, uh, uh, how it looks today. Uh, but the really cool thing, I think, with the book, which I love to just share with people, um, is um, this beautiful kind of embossed thing underneath the cover. Um, the, uh, the little icons around the words there are hounds. They are um, uh, deer hounds, uh, which are an important part of the poem. Uh, the poem is about, um, the herd of red deer that live on the mountain and um, uh, there's a scene towards the end with a hunt and, and the hounds are uh, chasing the deer so that's what they're doing uh, there. So uh, let me share you a picture of uh, the cover before I go on. So this is um, this is Ben Doran, this is what it looks like and this is um, obviously what the book looks like. You see it's beautiful um, kind of red glowing uh, mountain almost like the pelt of a red deer itself. Um, and uh, my book is a, is a long poem. It's a book length poem exploring various aspects of the ecology of the mountain, the history of the mountain, um, and it, it draws on a few different sources. I'll talk about those as I go along. But first of all, I just want to give you a feel of um, the start of the poem. This is the first part of the poem. It's in eight sections. This is the short first part. Um, and it's kind of an overture, um, like in a, in a piece of classical music, an overture gives you uh, the themes, the ideas which are going to come up throughout the piece. That's uh, really what, what part one of this poem it uh, does. And as I read it, I'd like you to um, imagine that you're in this landscape, this landscape that I've just shown you the picture of. Um, you're not standing on a hilltop, a hilltop looking down at it. You're, you're actually immersed in the middle of this landscape and stuff's happening all around you. You can uh, see a herd of red deer, you can hear birds singing, you can um, uh, feel the wind uh, against you. You can see the light uh, always changing on the hillside. That's, that's the kind of effect I wanted to create with this poem, that you're in the middle of this dynamic, vibrant, ever-changing landscape rather than um, you know, kind of looking at it from a distance or looking at it like it's a painting. Um, so this is part one, ground. How does it begin? With the piper's drone with the coarse fabric of the land 
in greens and greys and purples, the lines of hoof and song that cross it. The landscape is pibroch, the drone never silent, never still, then fingered notes soar up over the moor. Of all the high places, I praise Ben Doran. In beauty, she towers over other bends. I can't get enough of her. Look with me at the graceful sweep of land where the deer hold court, at the woods, those grassy groves where they browse, kingdom of cuckoo, wren and chaffinch, at the mountain's gleaming face. Look at the white rump team with the hunt in pursuit. They catch news on the wind and are gone. Over there is a stag who knows his mind, a deep one who doesn't need to brag. He cuts a fine figure, at home in his own skin, that summer coat of rich, unfading red, like a royal seal. This is the ground, the theme of the hill's great music, laid down in layers like lacquer, like myth, like the work of a wasp on its paper nest. If the hill could listen to itself, would it hear at the pace that lichen grows? Would it be tuned to the slow, dark mouths of moss on stone? Here is Ben Doran. Deer in their generations come and go with their rituals of sedge and dwarf willow. Wolves are here and in a downward inch of a boulder, they're gone. Volcanoes echo and now there's man. This is what you need to kill a stag. A rifle that's in working order. A marksman in his prime, someone who knows how to pull a trigger. The gun should have a good notched flint, screwed firm into the hammer, a cock that strikes true against the prison plate, an eight-sided barrel you can trust, a gun stock of unblemished walnut that fits snug against the shoulder. This way, you'll fell the most agile stag, but you need a real craftsman, a specialist in deer, one who'll succeed in spite of them, a subtle hunter. Like the peregrine who, Enthroned on her thermals, circles her prey, unseen, unheard, calibrating wind speed, pressure, rock dove velocity. She focuses on the apex of its wings, which look to her as if there is a heartbeat away, until she decides that everything is right. She falls back her wings and stoops, 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 and with her talons foremost strikes a kill. I saw a deer drive once. There was a team of lads and dogs with Patrick in the glen conducting them. A chorus of shot, the dogs driven on, and a hind of the high hill brought down. Okay, so that's the opening section of the poem, uh, part one of eight, called Ground. Uh, and it's a kind of unusual book, this, an unusual sort of poem, this. So I, I just want to explain a little bit about what, uh, where it comes from, uh, what it's doing, uh, how it combines ideas from a few different places. So it's um, about, half of, about half of the book, about half of the poem uh, that I've produced is actually a translation. It's not original. It's a kind of free English translation uh, based on an 18th century Gallic poem by a poet called Duncan Van McIntyre. Uh, McIntyre lived beside Ben Doran for uh, uh, part of his life. He was a gamekeeper, he worked the land, uh, he, was, he was a tenant on the land. Um, uh, if you look at the mountain on, on the cover, um, I'll just show you it again, he, he probably lived uh, just up here, just up this valley up here, so he lived really in the shadow of the mountain and daily life would mean walking across it um, and, and, and working um, in, in the vicinity. Um, and McIntyre was illiterate, he was an oral poet, he composed uh, a wonderful um, long poem in praise of this mound and in praise of Ben Doran uh, in Gaelic. Uh, someone else had to write it down for him, he composed this thing all in his head, you know, and, and carried it about with them and, and, and uh, dictated it to someone who wrote it for him. Uh, and the poem uh, is about 500 lines. And it's a really interesting poem. It's not like you'd expect a poem about a mountain to be, especially an old poem about a mountain. When you think of 
old poems about mountains, you might think of someone like William Wordsworth, someone who climbs to the top of the mountain and stands there kind of uh, exalted and feeling how, how great they are to have got there and, and how their spirits have been raised by climbing to the top and how they're a master of all they can survey. Um, Duncan Van McIntyre never goes anywhere near the top of the mountain. He never mentions the top of the mountain at all. Um, and it's not a poem about him. It's not a poem about how the mountain makes him feel. Instead, it's a really loving, careful, minutely detailed study of um, what we'd maybe now call the biodiversity of the mountain. It's about the creatures that live there. It's about um, uh, the sounds of, of this landscape. It's about the sights of it. It's about light. It's about movement. Um, and in some ways, it's almost like a biological field study. It's, it's, he, he spends a lot of time studying red deer, the red deer that live on this mountain. And uh, I've always been really taken with this poem. I first read it in, in translation in an anthology. It was a translation by Ian Crichton Smith, a, a great Scottish writer from the 20th century who wrote in English and in Gaelic and who translated Gaelic. Um, and what poets like Ian Crichton Smith did when they translate um, in Praise of Ben Doran by Duncan by McIntyre is they focus a lot on how it sounds. They try and recreate the rhythms of uh, McIntyre's original. It's intensely rhythmical, um, intensely musical kind of thing. Uh, and I always got the feeling that when people do that, it sort of restricts the English. It restricts the language they've got in English. It means that it becomes an exercise in making it sound wonderful. And you lose some of the life and the light and the movement and the diversity that's also there in the original. So I wanted to create a translation that, um, that draws out all, all those things. But I didn't want to just translate this poem. I wanted to put it in conversation with the modern world. So what I've done, and let me just try and show you a page just as an example of that. Um, you can possibly see there's some, uh, some writing up here. This is on the left of the page. This is my translation of the Gaelic, followed by original words. So this is me writing in English, kind of in response to the Gaelic original. And there's a conversation between the two things. So the bit I read to start with, uh, part one, about half of what I read was, was translation and about half, the other half was original material. And that original material brings in stuff to do with ecology, stuff to do with contemporary science, stuff to do with um, Highland land use, that kind of really complicated political issue in the 21st century, uh, stuff to do with uh, the climate, to do with contemporary environmental uh, concerns, and, and all sorts of other things as well. And I'll be drawing out a few more of those as I, as I go on with the reading. And although I said I didn't really want to follow exactly the rhythms of McIntyre's original, there are some places where I pay tribute to that. And I just want to give you, uh, share with you a couple of those to give you a sense of uh, what McIntyre's poem sounds like. And if you heard it, um, in Gaelic, and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful poem um, in Gaelic, a very popular poem in Gaelic. It's been uh, set to music many times in, in, in different genres of music. Um, it's considered one of the masterpieces of Scottish Gaelic literature. Um, here are a couple of little samples of my kind of equi English equivalent of what it sounds like, very rhythmical driving kind of thing. This is, um, the first one is a description of um, a buck, a male deer on the hillside, a young male deer. There's a nifty wee buck, a virtuoso on the hill. He never slips, he never comes a cropper. He jinks over the slopes like a flying winger. He ranges through quarries, sure-footed, well-antlered. Come heather, come high ground, he climbs for the hell of it. Through bracken and brushwood, he freestyles, he wanders. At the foot of each gully, on the height of each hillock, He's playful, he's vital, long-strided, elusive. Okay, a wonderful kind of um, driving momentum there to, to the way this, this, um, this deer is described. And that's me trying to sort of pay tribute to, um, to, to McIntyre's writing. That's not, um, you know, and, and those words are translated from him. I'd like to give you another example of this. It's one that I'll um, probably share a little bit later on as well um, in another section. Um, but here's um, a description of a dog, a hunting dog, towards the end of the poem. And you, you listen out for the same rhythm, the same kind of uh, 
strong bold rhythm with a lot of rhyme in it and a lot of, uh, sort of repetitive sounds. With each man there's a dog, consumed by the duty and joy of the hunt. A swaggering warrior, powerful and potent, malicious and keen as a missile, impatient, surly, forbidding, boorish and sinister, yapping and yowling at the work he was bred for, brows bushy, jaws open, hackles erect, he quivers and shudders, his murder incarnate. Okay, so I thought it'd be really, uh, really great to share with you this kind of rhythm. This and this is this is something that comes from the Gaelic, but I, I don't follow that all the time. I have little samples of it throughout, just to give a sense of uh, the original. But I want to combine those with a lot of other uh, rhythms, with a lot of other um, ways of writing a poem. So sometimes the poem on the page laid out pretty traditionally. It's all, you know, a line to the left-hand margin. Um, there are rhymes. It's all in consecutive lines. But other times it moves a lot, about a lot. So there's a section where some young deer are playing, some calves are playing. And if you've ever seen a baby animal, pretty much any sort of baby mammal playing, you jump around a lot, they leap, they gamble, um, they, you know, sort of sprint in one direction, then change direction randomly and go in the other direction. Um, uh, they leap over each other, they leap on top of each other, all that sort of chaos. So the words on the page do that. They jump around all over the place from left to right um, with a lot of kind of, you know, space and movement between them as if they're jumping from tuft to tuft on the side of the hill. Um, and there's another section where um, uh, there's a description of a river, uh, a burn coming down the side of the hill. And um, the words meander down the page in a kind of, you know, a big S sort of shape, um, like a meandering river. And then the end, in a sort of pool of, of words at the bottom, which are sort of surrounded by um, the names of different species of moss, you know, the sorts of things that might surround um, uh, a burn and a pool on the side of a highland mountain. Um, so, so it's laid out in all sorts of interesting, un, unusual uh, uh, ways. And I've talked quite a bit about McIntyre's rhythm. Uh, the reason he writes like that, one of the, the one of the big influences on him when he was writing is bagpipe music. It's a genre of bagpipe music called pibroch, which I've um, I mentioned in the first section of the poem. It's one of the words in the first section of the poem. And pibroch is, is the kind of, uh, sort of symphony music or concerto music or something of, um, of bagpipes um, in the Highlands. It starts with um, a basic rhythm, a uh, basic uh, sequence of notes. And um, as, the, as the piece of music goes on, as the pibroch goes on, the piper adds in more and more knots in between that basic rhythm until their fingers are going as fast as they possibly can. Um, and uh, it's a real kind of virtuoso performance. It's like one of those you know, 80s guitar solos where they play as many notes as they can, that kind of, kind of, kind of feel, um, but always kind of coming back to this basic rhythm. And I thought, this is kind of cool, this is really great. That firstly, um, this is a poem modeled in bagpipe music. That's that's you know unusual and kind of a distinctive sort of thing, and I wanted to pay tribute to that. But the music itself leaves scope for additional things to be inserted in, additional notes to be added in, um, as much as um you know the bagpiper can can manage, and as much as me, the poet, can manage. So I've inserted my own um, interventions into the middle of translating uh, McIntyre's poem, and I'd like to. Uh, to read one of those in a moment, just to give you a sense of where it, it sort of explains what a pibroch is um, and, and explains how it relates, um, I think, to this poem. Uh, there are lots of references to music um, throughout the poem, throughout my poem. And in some ways, I like to think of it not just to do with bagpipe music, but if you think of something like hip hop or acid jazz, what those um, genres of music um, do, um, is they often sample something that already exists. You know, they, they take a sample from a pre-existing song, of whatever a genre, um, and they'll extract it, they'll, they'll play it, and they'll embellish it with their own kind of improvisation or their own lyrics or something else on top of it. Um, in a way that was kind of in the back of my mind do, doing, doing this poem, I was sampling or, um, uh, you know, extracting bits from Duncan Van McIntyre. Um, and, and going off on my own kind of riffs um, on top of it. So here's a section where um, I explain Pibroch. This is the very start of our uh, section two, part two of the poem. 
Uh, this section is called movement. This is the, the first page of it. It's about five pages long, but this is the first page. And the thing about Pibroch is in Gaelic, it's, um, it's often called Kilmore, um, which means the big music. Um, uh, that's as, as opposed to the little music, which is more kind of casual bagpipe music. That's the kind of, you know, everyday bagpipe music. But the great bagpipe music is, you know, the formal stuff is called the big music. Um, for anyone who's interested in that, Kirsty Gunn has a wonderful novel called The Big Music, which I really recommend. Um, here's um, part two of the poem. Pibroch, Kilmore, the big music of the gales. Ground and movement are its theme and variation. Ben Doran is a Pibroch. Deer are the reed through which the mountain is played. The song is in the piper's view. Her fingers climb not to a summit, but the plateau where she stays for as long as she can. Endurance as craft, technique as footsteps on the surface of the possible. Rivers and boulders, heather, bracken, scree. Phrases repeat. Ben Doran is a pibroch. The ground is embellished with the limits of grace. The piper walks out into the Pibroch. Sometimes she comes back to the ground. Sometimes the song takes off like a deer fleeing over the heath. Okay, so music's really important um, to the poem. It's important to the rhythm of it. It's important to the sound of it um, and, and uh, you know, the way it's kind of constructed and put together on the page. But there's other kinds of music in the poem as well. The poem is so, um, well, Duncan Van McIntyre is so brilliant at observing the deer and the natural world around him and doing that in a very unsentimental way, very literal way, like a 20th century field study where someone, you know, an ecologist goes out and studies um, animals. Um, that's kind of his approach and, and what he does in a poem. It's sort of really, you know, amazing. That's not what we usually think of poems as doing, as being like kind of, biological field studies. Um, and the poem is full of the sound of animals communicating. It's not just a poem made up of words which, which have their own sounds. There is communication um, between animals. So I want to give you a little example of this. This is um, uh, deer music, I suppose you would say. It's deer communicating with each other. Um, and you know we sometimes forget that with animals, that a lot of creatures you know, they have their own distinctive means of communicating with each other. They can hear each other. They can they can um, express ideas in some ways. It's maybe not the same as human language, but you know, they're not just making sounds. They're they're often communicating with each other, um, and there's there's content to that. And sometimes we as humans can interpret that, but but it, the animals themselves have interpretations of that. So this is a description of deer, various different deer, um, communi communicating with each other, and this combines stuff from Duncan Van McIntyre's 18th century poem, along with um, stuff which I brought in from, from the modern world. Listen from their great, from their, sorry, I'll start that bit again. Listen from their slender frames resounds a great music, the clear, honest melody of their distant calls. Hind will stitch her voice into the wind, a sharp staccato bark, with intervals of five to 15 seconds. Her role is to warn the herd of trouble. At her bark, they're instantly alert. The leader carries the tune alone. No other member of the herd joins in with this salute, this gathering song, this retreat. It's a special sound when they start with their keening and crooning. I take it over all the music of the gales, this sweet song, this breath passed down through generations, this ardent belling on the face of Ben Doran. But look down there at the fussy grey hind wallowing in the pool while her herd bark. She has funny ways, that girl, and the mood takes her. Do you hear that stag with the distinctive roar hauled from the fathoms of his chest? When he strikes up, you hear him in the next glen. He roars roaringly. He can roar no other way. The world is its own true self in him. 
So that's the one of the ways in which there's a lot of communication going on in the poem, and it's not just human communication. It's um, male and female deers with their distinctive uh, calls or distinctive sounds uh, speaking to each other. And and you, if you're the you know you're in the poem, you're in the middle of the landscape. These sounds are happening all around you, and there are things you know there are things which you can get some handle on, but maybe not quite fully understand in the way that, that deer would understand these things happening in the landscape. And as I've said, I, one of the things that drew me to this poem in the first place, to Duncan Van McIntyre's poem, and that I wanted to build on was his wonderful perceptive observation of the natural world and really sort of caring observation, unsentimental, but um, affectionate. He, he, he loves this place and he's intimately connected with it and he's, he's, he's worked in it and he's lived in it for uh, a fair chunk of his life. Uh, and one of the places where I was really struck by his um, description he has, he has a few lines in the poem where he describes some, uh, some stags and some hinds kind of frolicking across the hill. And it's only about four or five lines where as I was reading it and as I was trying to translate it, I thought he's being a little bit coy here. He's, he's not quite describing everything that's going on. And I figured this must be a description of the rut and of rutting behavior, you know, a really important part of the life cycle of deer, um, obviously, and um, a big kind of seasonal event in the autumn where um, suddenly all the deer come together. Usually throughout the year, uh, females live in bands of, on, on, on their own, um, sort of matriarchies with, with their calves with them, and the stags are all off alone. And then um, uh, uh, annually in, in the rut, they all kind of come together on a hillside quite high up where there's lots of fresh grass and uh, the stag have been growing their antlers, they, they joust and they fight um, uh, for, uh, to be kind of top dog, to be top stag. Um, and they get a kind of um, band of females that are, that are their kind of band of females. Biolog biologists call this a harem. Um, that's their sort of proper word for it. Um, and I thought it'd be really interesting to put this in a poem. Um, it's not, you know, with, with a lot of biological detail, really, a lot of um, uh, specific detail from, drawn from people who know a lot about red deer. So I, I, I researched um, rutting behavior and expanded um, McIntyre's original in, into um, a much bigger description um, of, of deer, um, of, of this animal's um, sex life, if you like. But, um, um, you know, maybe with some, some ways in which it um, is relevant to human beings too. Um, so, so here's um, part of um, uh, part six, which is called the rut. Years later, I still think of them, glorious, a gallus team striding forth in the flesh of the moment, assembling to jostle and clatter up the cliffs. Between the moor with the naked birch and the mouth of Fortress Corrie, they carry themselves like lords outside commerce, outside property law. The land is theirs and they serve it. This is their paradise enclosed by hills. They wander up the sides of Bracken Corrie, thread through the pass to the field of hard water, to the plain we used to call Wolf's Garden. They browse at Willow Crag, roam the northern slopes where two, rud to where two ridges run together like the cloven halves of a hoof. On the high moor, where the autumn tides of grass usher in the rut, the hinds are parading. A matriarchal tribe, they tolerate the stags for six weeks in a year. The thrill of the season is on them. The stag is hefted to a moving territory, his harem in the hills. They sport with each other, bound over moorland and moss. When a hind strays, the stag brings her back. When she slows, he lowers his head and tries to lay his coarse chin on her rump. Too early in Estrus, she races off. They charge through bogs. He rakes the ground one antler at a time and pisses in the wallow pool. He fills his lungs with its buttery citric musk. 
He rolls until his coat and the earth and the whole glen, if he could, are penetrated with his presence. She becomes aroused. The stag, like a master of wine, noses her vulva, takes a sip of her on his tongue, draws back his upper lip to better taste her readiness. They're a carnival of desire. He licks her head, her neck, the base of her tail. She rubs her whole length along his ribs, working towards his rear until she makes to mount him. Ben Doran hosts a bacchanal. Now he mounts her, she stands. He mounts her, she stands. He mounts her, she stands. He mounts her, she stands in the infinity of herself. The countless interwoven trails of all that she is. Gladness, lust, the sense of rut, textures of fur and grass in the gut, pebble in a hoof, iron in the blood, the weight of the stag as he mounts and thrusts. At last she'll stand in the queerness of pregnancy, one body antlering into two. So I really wanted to pay a lot of attention in, in the spirit of Duncan Van McIntyre, a lot of attention to the life cycle of deer, the life cycle of the hillside. There's a lot of discussion of um, uh, uh, the plants that the deer like to eat, the best places for them to find water, um, different aspects of deer behavior. There's mention of wallowing in a couple of the sections um, that I read, deer love a good wallow. They love to wallow in the mud. They love to you know, coat themselves in the mud. Uh, they love to rub themselves against boulders to get rid of, uh, you know, flies and so on. Um, they follow paths across the hillside. Uh, some some biologists think that um, some of the deer paths in the highlands have been there for for centuries, if not longer. That they, they, they keep following the same routes. Um, so there's a lot of um, discussion of that in the poem. A lot of that natural history, I guess you'd say. But another aspect of the poem. Uh, or another aspect that really concerned me when I was writing the poem was to draw out uh, the meanings of deer for us, for what deer mean in human culture, uh, partly the culture of the Highlands or, or the rest of Britain, but, but also looking out beyond just British culture and into wider kind of um, ideas about deer. And deer are really interesting. You know, they're very widespread animals um, across the world, different species, and often in a lot of different cultures, they've been hunted um, for all of human history. They've been essential food source. They still are um, for some uh, people, particularly in, in the far north of um, Asia and North America. There are deer species that are really important for survival for, for humans. Um, and they often become a kind of symbol of wildness, a symbol of the wild. You know, they're an animal which is mostly not domesticated. They're not like sheep and cows and horses, which have been domesticated and part of everyday life. They are part of many people's lives, but always outside of, of society, always wild. Um, so I wanted to explore that in the poem. Uh, and I guess the other thing I wanted to do with not just focusing on Highland mythology, I wanted to say, here's a lot of stuff from Gaelic culture and a lot of stuff from Highland culture and Scottish culture. And it can stand in conversation with stuff from, from around the world. It doesn't need to be just a parochial looking in, into ourselves and our own uh, cultural history. That's, I don't think that's a healthy thing. Um, I don't think it's a fruitful thing. Um, I, I, I'm much more interested in, in having conversations, kind of international cosmopolitan conversations and, and saying, you know, Scottish culture belongs in that, not, not in any kind of, you know, it's not superior to other cultures, but it can be part of a conversation with them. So. So that's part of what I wanted to do to sort of internationalize this one specific location in the Highlands, to internationalize a load of stuff from, from Scottish culture, including this old Gaelic poem. So here's a section um, titled Myth. Uh, you'll see why. And again, it starts um, one of the wonderful things in, in McIntyre's writing that I wanted to really draw out is the deer are always individuals. They're not just a kind of homogenous background animal. 
He knows these, you know, different individuals in the herd. He knows their behavior, their personalities, what they sound like, what they look like. Um, sort of thing that you get in, um, I guess, David Attenborough programs now, you know, you know, you, you get the, the names that researchers are given the animals, you get their different personalities. McIntyre is doing this in an 18th century Gallic poem, and I wanted to, to draw that out. So it starts with another individual, but then it goes into culture. The first part of the cultural sort of riff is, is a translation of McIntyre, but then it, it goes into um, the stuff that's my own original material. That small hind there, all day she grunts and grumbles to her young, and in them are woven those ancient threads, intimacy and fear. Ears swivel, primed to listen. Her eyes scan the hills, a lookout. She's got hooves she can trust to carry her over the moors. Bring on the Gallic heroes of old. Bring on culture, the quick, the man who runs with the sureness of a buck who can speak the tongue of every living thing. Bring on Cahulan, son of the storm, warrior wilder than any dog, fury of the fight itself. And while you're at it, bring on all the horses and men of King George. Unless her skin is torn by the first lead shot, there's no one on earth who will take her alive. She runs into the margins of time's book, where words and landscape fuse in an ecology of myth. Look as she joins the four red stags who gnaw at the shoots of Yggdrasil. Look as her heart's torn out on the step and the shaman rides her soul to the other world. Look at Carnunos, the virile god, the horned one, the Celtic god of the wild. Look as St. Kentigern yokes her to a plough, taming wildness in the name of God. Look at her lying with the terracotta troops, ears pricked for the noise of the hunt and the emperor's next life. Turn away in fear as she glides through the woods holy dark, Artemis and her golden hind. Turn away as the Choctaw deer woman lures young men into a trap of their own lust. Turn away as Saraswati, river of wisdom, wisdom, Brahma's creative power, puts on her hooves, her pelt, as red as the first rays of the sun. So my poem, Ben Doran, explores the cultural meanings of deer, what deer mean to, to us and what they've meant to different cultures throughout time and across the world. And alongside that, there's a little bit of uh, reflection on the Highland landscape today and, and what, what the landscape means to us in the Highlands. Um, you know, we think of it as a beautiful place to visit. It's a place that I've really you know, missed going to in the last um, year or so. Um, uh, we find that um, in, in many people find it enriching to go to the Highlands, to, to visit the Highlands. Uh, for the people that, that live and work in the Highlands, they maybe have slightly different understandings of what the place means and what it is like. Um, and the Highlands has been really marked by um, a great deal of social and political upheaval and, and environmental ecological upheaval over the last few hundred years. Um, Duncan Ban McIntyre uh, lived and worked beside Ben Doran uh, in the mid 18th century. However, he was um, uh, evicted from the land, uh, part of what we now call the Highland Clearances. Um, you'd probably say he ended up um, in Edinburgh uh, working in the town constabulary um, and, and spent more than half his life in, in the city. Uh, the land that he knew the land where he lived and it was an incredibly rich um, uh, biodiverse place uh, was suddenly um, filled with sheep. Sheep were more profitable for, for the landlord. Uh, they completely changed the landscape of the mountain. Um, so it now looks like this. It's heather. Um, uh, it's not, you know, like this green lush kind of landscape which McIntyre would probably have known and certainly that's the way it comes across in, in a lot of his poem. Uh, uh, it's now a hillside where, you know, there aren't really very many, if any, Gaelic speaking inhabitants living nearby. The actual um, ecological makeup of the place is not something 
McIntyre uh, would really recognize now if he could if he could come and see it. So I wanted to explore that in the poem and give a sense of the mountain through time, I suppose, you know, to say it's had those wonderful lush periods in its history. It's had sort of deep geological past when there's volcanoes and stuff like that. Um, and now there's um, there's other kind of, you know, things going on there. So here's a brief section, which is um, kind of a list of different different things on uh, um, to, to do with the hillside, things which McIntyre might have seen um, versus things which exist now and things which are, you know, uh, creatures which are common across the highlands versus ways in which humans have, have affected the landscape of the highlands very dramatically. Um, but here's just a little sample of, of how I'm trying to capture that, that dynamic in the poem. This is from part seven, which is titled Web. High on the ridge, the wind leans in and blows through fluted crevices, the chanter of the hill. Magpie moth, mountain ringlet, northern egger, northern dart, emperor moth, green tiger beetle, heath bumblebee, four-spotted chaser. The music of the wind gaps summons forth the lads of the glen, drawing them to the slopes where they know the herd will be, where their mortal songs ring out on gun barrel pipes. Sheep grazing, moor burning, barbed wire, soil erosion, railway curled around the western slopes, viaduct A82, estate roads, grouse butts, winter deer food, micronized wheat cubes, crane flies, sheep ticks, black slugs, deer flies, turbines, super quarries, pylons, hydro locks, conifer forest, 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 conifer forest. If you've ever spent much time in the Highlands of Scotland, you'll know the phenomenon of conifer forest. It's like this sort of, uh, you know, vast blocks of land with these regimented uh, uh, trees on them. Uh, not something that existed in Duncan Ban McIntyre's time in that way. Um, but, a, but a real kind of you know makeup of the trees in the highlands now, and you can see some of that um, from the slopes of Ben Doran today. I'd like to finish with by reading, um, if I have time, the, the the final section of the poem, Part Eight, which is called Emergence. Um, it's quite a long section. It's quite a complicated section. Uh, a couple of things I want to explain about it first. One is it. Um, mentions um, a figure called Amergan at the very start. Amergan was a mythical poet, um, Irish Gaelic poet, um, uh, stepped uh, onto the land in Ireland from a boat and, and sang a kind of hymn to uh, creation um, to the world in which he says, you know, I am the wind ranging over the sea and, and, and language like that. He kind of says, you know, he's intimately connected with all these things in nature. Um, uh, my poem draws on this this hymn uh, by Amergan, but modernizes it and brings it into kind of modern environmental um, concerns and ideas. Uh, the other thing to mention is it ends with a hunt. It's a really difficult thing for me to, to deal with in this poem and to think about. Uh, McIntyre writes as enthusiastically about the hunt uh, of the deer as he does about the, the daily lives of the deer themselves. Um, that's a really challenging mindset for us thinking now we're living in a very different society. A uh, deer for him, would have been, um, you know, an essential food source. They weren't being hunted for pleasure, for sport, being hunted as, as part of a kind of continuum. Um, they would have been hunted pretty sustainably. Um, uh, there was there was never any thought of, you know, hunting all of the deer, but just um, having enough in order for for human life and society to go on. Um, and I, but I wanted to complicate that with some of the more negative aspects that hunting and that people's interventions in all sorts of ways in the natural world um, uh, have today. So here's um, uh, at least part of the final section of the poem, Emergence. American, mythic bard who strode from coracle to shore, 
chanting the Celtic earth, its flowerings, fruitings, maltings, entangle us in the present of your song, the emergent world. I am the wind ranging over the sea. I am wave and ocean, climate systems. I am the charge and circuit board. I am elm and heather, aspen, alder. I am hawkweed hybridizing. I am the root and arrow of the yew. I am hookworms, pinworms, whipworms, rhizomes, spores. I am herbivore, and apex predator. I am the subsoil superstrings of honey fungus, the woods leviathan. I am hazelnut and slowworm scales. I am rust on pit wheels and dockyard cranes. I am peregrines perching on a tower block roof. I am lace worker stitching in air. I am the hunter downwind among the rocks. I am the hind fearing footsteps on the wind, fearing bullets and blood and terror and dogs. It takes skill to stalk a deer, a flare for patience bordering on witchcraft, earache from the winter wind, frozen hands that hold a gun for three hours as you wait for her to stand. I am the glacier of cloud flooding the glen. I am Pangaea, Laurentia, Afro-Eurasia. I am the hyper-objectivity of the hill. She's alone. Approach her at the pace that eggshell thickens, that berries ripen among the thorns. Work your way through a cover. If she's spooked, if she raises her head and you're not invisibly still, if she lowers her head again, but out of the corner of her eye, she sees you breathe. If she scents a single pheromone of you, she's gone. Do you take the land into yourself? Or does the land receive you further into it? I am the world as sharp as an adder's tooth. Rethink knowledge, not information, not even sense data. Knowing the hill means prone legs drawn into the dampening earth. It means peating your hair, your boots, your lungs. Negotiate each pit and fold, each clump, each tuft of grass. Your knee stiffens on cold stone. Heraclitus, each individual thing comes out of the one, and the one comes out of each thing. You open door after door until you can go no further. Taste of bilberry and bracken, memories of boulders, the angles of concealment, cartography of clouds, shadows moving over the earth. Body and land, air and mind close on each other. Plant and human, stone and bird are one weave, one plaid. If you're humble, there's a chance that in spite of their best efforts, you will kill a deer. Fix your resolute, rewilded eye on a stag. Gather to you all your threads of instinct, experience, skill. Steer the long-barreled trickster, the glutton, coyote, raven, and bokken at the heart of the running mountain. Rest the inner joint of a finger on the trigger, mechanism poised to pounce, to lash out at your will. Yes, yours, dear reader, dear hunter, for meaning, for order, prime mover, destroyer of worlds. And I'd like to finish just with the, the climax of this hunt. The hunt um, uh, continues. It's a combination of modern sort of deer stalking kind of hunt with, um, uh, with guns, with, uh, with um, the kind of hunting that Duncan Van McIntyre would have known, where, um, which involved dogs and involved chasing deer into a particular area. Uh, so this is uh, the climax of um poem, the climax of the hunt. Um, I hope it captures uh, the sadness of the hunt, as I kind of feel it, as well as the kind of the excitement that, that maybe McIntyre um, uh, felt while writing, writing this. With each man there's a dog, consumed by the duty and joy of the hunt, a swaggering warrior, powerful and potent, malicious and keen as a missile, impatient, surly, forbidding, boorish and sinister, yapping and yowling at the work he was bred for, brows bushy, jaws open, hackles erect, he quivers and shudders, his murder incarnate, the drive is a tidal wave, a headlong pursuit, unpredictable. 
echoes bay for blood. The sons and daughters of the rock answer back with their baying. A shaggy-headed hound calls out. He forces the herd from their high havens. Hooves try to fathom the depths of the hill, its hidden tracks, its shortcuts, but there are pools too deep for a deer to sound. A hind drags the torn gown of herself into the surge. She looks up into eyes other than her own. The pack charge on. Another hind is seized by the throat, another and another, each in her own grief, like, like a cliff top stream falling into the sea, like a spark thrown out from the peaks to the stone hearth, always the clamor of the hunt. There was too much. I can't give the deer all it is their due. I have tried, and now the words slip away. All that's left are the song lines of the hill, its typeface of lichen and stone, the semantics of the thousand tones of fast and deep and shallow burns, water seeping into hoof prints, wind filling a raven's wings, wasps chewing bark from the heather, a hare pressing into moss, a moth settling on a leaf, the breathing shapes of deer. Thank you very much and thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much, Gary. That was absolutely, absolutely brilliant and so, so resonant. And I, I, I just love the way you wove past and present kind of modernizing, but also paying tribute to that that past and you know as you said it, it does it does really zoom in on a particular kind of place and landscape but it zooms out you know as well and and broader kind of global concerns so that was absolutely beautiful thank you so much for for sharing it with us and thank you to everyone um who is here for for joining us really appreciate you being here with us i've popped in the chat as i mentioned um where you can uh order a copy of gary's book online that's the easiest place to do it is just straight from the publisher's website the publisher is the irish pages press and i've popped that link there in the chat um so do be sure to check that out we got a, a comment from rosalind russell I I don't know if you've you've seen that in the chat Gary but she said it's a beautiful book to have and my copy was sent very quickly from Irish Pages I highly recommend it highly so thank and you very much Rosalind <laughs> And thank, and thank you very much for, for being here, Gary. Really, really enjoyed that. So thank you so much for the reading and thanks to everyone for being here and hope that you have a great, great rest of your evening and great rest of the festival as well. So bye everybody. Thanks thank very you. much. Bye.